Hello and welcome to Vanderbilt Philosophy Faculty Interviews. Uh, today we're we're turning the tables. The interviewer has become the interviewed. I'm sitting here with Professor Scott Aiken. Um, Scott uh, specializes in epistemology, ancient philosophy, American pragmatism. He's also done some work in philosophy of religion, argumentation theory. Um, Scott began his academic career in classics uh, at Washington University in St. Louis before I guess getting seduced into philosophy at some point um, and getting a master's uh, at University of Montana before, um, finally, last but not least, getting a PhD in this very department. Right here, yeah. Uh, the Vanderbilt Philosophy Department. Um, too many books to, you know, we'd go well beyond the time we have in this interview to uh, to list everything uh, uh, on, on Professor Aiken's CV. I'll trick myself to three here. Um, Three, three, three biggies, um, Evidentialism and the Will to Believe from 2014. Um, just last year, co-authored with our own Robert Talese, uh, Political Argument in a Polarized Age. And a forthcoming book, you've got a book coming out, this, uh, Straw Man Arguments, A Case Study in Fallacy Theory, also co-authored uh, with John Casey. Um, so thanks so much for sitting down with me, Scott. Matt, thank you for that really generous interview or uh, introduction, and thanks for running this interview. Um, really happy to be here. Happy that folks are watching. Mm -hmm. uh, happy to just do some philosophy. Yeah, let's do it. Well, <laughs> why don't we start at the beginning? How did you, how did you get into philosophy? Well, um, there are really kind of two intersecting stories. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is going to be one familiar to pretty much anyone who tells the story about getting interested in philosophy, which is, uh, but the case the cases are a little bit different. Um, but the, the longer or the long arc is that I was really interested in just Greek stuff. Mm -hmm. I love sword and sandals movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I loved the, I love the myths. Uh -huh. I like uh -huh. I, I, the architecture struck me just mm -hmm. everything about ancient Greece. And then the sort of the Roman appropriations just, just had a grasp on me since yeah. I was very, very small. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so just love that stuff. Um, and so when I went to college, it was like, there was just going to be no question about it. Mm -hmm. I was in, I was into the sciences and I was good at math nice. and things like that. And that was one of the things, but I also saw that Greek stuff yeah. as being the thing that I was mm -hmm. best at and that I wanted to do. And I showed up and started taking classes, um, at Washington and St. Louis. I was going to be a committed classics major. And, um, but I kept finding these, uh, these Greeks and these Romans to say things that I thought were false. <laughs> <laughs> How dare they? I know. <laughs> and I thought the problem was me. <laughs> I was like, oh, I have to improve my Latin or yeah, something like that. If, right. if I'm thinking that Seneca is wrong, yeah. clearly the, Little the, old me. Fall, <laughs> the fall lies with me. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, what was happen and what kept happening yeah. was that uh, my classics professors were like, that's an awesome question. We have a different discipline for that. We can't fix this mm -hmm. by fixing your Latin. Your Latin is just fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good enough. Um, the problem is philosophical. Um, we can do we can do that over here, but there's a whole department devoted to you fighting it out with them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so I discovered that kind of late in my uh, career uh, as an undergraduate, um, and realized that that was really where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't have the background really sufficient to go to a PhD program in philosophy, I ended up going to a master's program in philosophy at the University of Montana. Mm -hmm. Found my legs there. Um, got into got into logic. Got into argumentation theory there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then ended up here at Vanderbilt on the other side of that MA. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted again a, a department where I could kind of do some history and do contemporary things. And these sort of pluralistic style departments were uh, really appealing to me because yeah. just everything in philosophy looked interesting. Everything in philosophy looked good. Well, or at the very least, equally bad. In mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as our as our as our shared friend Jay Bernstein used to say, uh -huh. every philosopher is every other philosopher's worst enemy. Yeah. <laughs> they all looked equally bad and all it looked yeah. equally worth arguing about. Mm -hmm. And so a place like Vanderbilt was where I needed to be and a place where I really flourished. I was lucky mm -hmm. that I came here and had faculty members that were interested in what I, what I had to say and wanted to see, wanted to see more of it and see it better. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a great cohort of other graduate students here. And so I just count myself as very lucky uh, that I had this path where um, I kind of got hooked on philosophy early, uh, again, uh, and ended up developing some skills to be able to do it reasonably well, given my classics training, mm -hmm. uh, and then showed up in places where folks uh, really helped me um, get better at it uh, mm -hmm. by giving me the right kind of feedback, the right kind of critical feedback, yeah. um, and, uh, and giving me opportunities to, to, to shine whenever I was ready to. Mm -hmm. 
So it's interesting. So that also with this transition from classics to philosophy, it's sort of the transition from studying an area because you think it's cool and you just want to learn more about it, uh, and then and then discovering that it's actually kind of field that leads to your own reflections and spurs you on. That's, uh, that's right. That's really interesting. That was one of the. That was actually one of the surprising things mm -hmm. that came out of it was that. Um, I thought that I, whenever I came out of classics and was going into my MA program, I thought that I was already really good at philosophy mm -hmm. because I was really good at knowing Plato stuff. <laughs> like, so knowing what he said online. Uh, yeah, it's exactly. Uh, it's yeah. like, I can quote him in Greek. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. like that, I thought that made me good at philosophy. Right. Because um, I was just interested in that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it turns out that there are a whole other set of skills that uh, that needed to be mastered in order to be good at philosophy. Yeah. Um, and having your own voice. And so that was one of the things that was sort of nascent in there was that... Um, that intellectual autonomy mm -hmm. element to yeah. it that yeah. uh that you that you know you're wrestling with the greats and they're great for a reason yeah. mm -hmm. and you want to honor that uh, but in some ways uh that doesn't sort of drown out your own voice and right. in fact an occasion to sort of make your it, it mature your mm -hmm. own voice uh, like that's one of your mo one mm -hmm. of your models mm -hmm. uh, looking for some maturation there and uh uh arguing with folks who are sort of at the top of their game intellectually is a yeah. great way to do that yeah um, so let me just one follow up to the sort of the, the intellectual uh, biography here. Uh, not many people end up teaching at the place they studied at. Uh, yeah, they get their PhD. Uh, and yeah so how fortunate I am. What, uh, um, what's it like to be on sort of both sides of that? Well, right. There's a kind of a there's a uh, there is a boon and a curse mm -hmm. to it. Uh, so we'll just put it this way. You can't be a prophet in your hometown. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, we'll just say that the, that uh, there's the, the the drawback to it is that uh, there are a lot of times where I'm sitting in the seminar room or I'm sitting in one of these offices and mm -hmm. I'm like, I had a conversation in this office mm -hmm. 25 years ago and <laughs> I made terrible errors. <laughs> um, and so there are moments where that's sort of the shadow mm -hmm. of past me. Uh, uh, who you know was way too overconfident in his capacities and didn't really know a lot, but yet nevertheless talked a lot. Um, and so that shadow and that ghost of me still mm -hmm. wanders these halls and mm -hmm. sometimes gets mistaken for the real me by some of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, but then there's another uh, benefit to it, which is uh, I'm really invested in this place. Yeah. You know, uh, I know a lot of the history. I know, uh, and I'm I'm invested in it. Um, in in a way that like you know like again you can't be a prophet in your hometown but you're always you're always part of that hometown mm -hmm. and um and so i feel invested in this place not just because of the fact that i'm a faculty member um i'm an alum um i feel the sort of the i feel i feel the 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 elders mm -hmm. <laughs> here you know what i mean uh the folks that have retired folks that have moved on uh, I, f I still in some ways feel like I'm carrying on some of their their thought, their insight, their inspiration here. Um, and so, uh, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a kind of welcome burden. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, there's a kind of a direction, there's a kind of a spirit uh, uh, to, to, to Vanderbilt philosophy that, um, you know, having been here since the late 90s, uh, I feel, and especially being both on the graduate student side, a lecturer side and then a faculty side kind of feel like yeah. I've seen a lot of angles of this yeah. place so feel really invested feel like it's really part of me um, feel like yeah. I'm part of it so yeah, yeah I have a real history here yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your research okay and well in, in a way we're going back to you know your first love the Greeks okay so um, <laughs> you you've been a lot of your work has been um, on the ancient Greeks but in particular you've been interested in this particular um, ancient Greek uh, Stoic uh, Epictetus, Epictetus. Um, and um, the Enchiridion in particular. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work in that area? So uh, I'm doing a, so the, the big project right now, and it's coming to fruition, uh, <laughs> hey, making promises on, yeah. on record, oh boy. Yeah, yep. uh, mm -hmm. So um, uh, is a, tr a new translation and commentary on Epictetus's Enchiridion, uh, the handbook of Stoicism. Um, and uh, that's in conjunction with Bill Stevens uh, of Creighton University. And uh, the plan is, uh, look, the, the Enchiridion is written in Koine Greek, mm -hmm. and that's supposed to be like the really accessible Greek of the realm. And so it needs to be really accessible English. It can't be stilted English. Stilted mm -hmm. English is going to be something that's inaccessible. The whole point of Epictetus' Enchiridion is it's in Koine for a reason that Stoicism has an easy on-ramp, and, and, and it's a way from you to... Th think if you apply critical thinking to common sense you should be able to find your way there 
So, uh, so part, so part of the translation project is to make it as accessible as we can. Mm -hmm. and that requires a little bit of, you know, playing with things here and there and breaking a few, you might say, sort of stuffy classicist conventions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but that's, <laughs> uh, and so that, that, that there may be costs mm -hmm. incurred for that. Um, but then the second part of it is that, um, Stoicism is a high rationalist, is a pr rationalist program in ethics, which means that all the principles are principles that come out of reasoning, the ones that are, uh, and uh, every feature of one's own motivation, one's, one's emotional states, uh, are ones that are product of your capacity to think and think truly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, every moment in the Enchiridion, by our estimate, has got two features to it. One of them is what we call the maximally argumentative feature, mm -hmm. that everything in the Enchiridion is something that it, rem it should be reminding you of an argument for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what a commentary on the Enchiridion does is it's something that cracks every one of these things open like a nut and says, look, if you're it, it, like stoic training in some ways provides you with the arguments for this. You don't get that just with the Enchiridion. The Enchiridion mm -hmm. is in some ways a reminder of the, yeah. uh, of the arguments and the reasoning to it. Sometimes you can do it on your own. Sometimes it's in the Enchiridion. Sometimes it's in the background. Mm -hmm. Our job as the commentators is to crack those nuts open. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of the Enchiridion is one that's uh, the handbook that's familiar, which is that it's a workbook. Mm -hmm. It's a set of exercises that you do for yourself to remind yourself of certain kinds of stoic principles of the good life how to be able to live in light of the grand division between what's up to you and what's not up to you. And once you see that, uh, there are certain kinds of exercises of reminding yourself of that. And what the Enchiridion is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is effectively a set of exercises then. You do the reasoning to the principles and then you apply the principles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if anyone's seen anyone uh, has seen Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations is, in fact, like the workbook side mm -hmm. of the handbook. It's like the handbook is a set of exercises. Marcus Aurelius's Meditations is what you do on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. You think your way through and you reason to the principles, and then you see how those principles um, are relevant to and are applicable to problems in your life, ways that you can think things through a little bit more clearly, ways that you can kind of correct for um, some, in some ways the madness that culture <laughs> imposes on us mm -hmm. with all the values, the new, we need a new thing, or the, someone slighted you, or I don't have enough money to do the thing that I want. All of these crazy false, false values that sort of impinge on us, um, what these exercises do is uh, allow you a kind of a freedom from mm -hmm. them. You see through their illusions. Mm -hmm. um, so the commentary then is the reasons for these principles, clarification of these principles, and then a set of sort of simple exercises that one does on the other side of it to be able to see how they're relevant. Well, that's, that's, I mean, a really nice um, expression of like the, 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 in, the, the way in which ancient Greek thought is very often um, both a kind of like abstract philosophical exercise, but quite practical, very concrete, very keyed into asking the question, how should I live? And trying to actually genuinely pursue that. Yeah, I think that, that I think that that's right. I think that the core of the, all of the Greek thoughts is, are about what's the good life. Mm -hmm. What's the good life? Well, how do right. how do I live well? And a lot of that still requires. And again, the Stoics are very much behind this because it's all about argument and things like that. They have to perfect your reasoning. You mm -hmm. have to get clear about the world, uh, and you have to perfect your critical thinking. But all of those things are in the service of a good life. Mm -hmm. uh, that it's a kind of an organic whole. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of the theoretical stuff. Are, are things that are really important, but um, but they've all kind of got this practical orientation. And I'll just even say, um, one of one of the things that I owe to one of uh, our prior teachers here at Vanderbilt, John Locks, mm -hmm. uh, was someone who was continually reminding everyone about this, about Stoicism. Mm -hmm. uh, he even wrote a book, Stoic Pragmatism, mm -hmm. that Stoicism is a kind of pragmatic yeah. view, that it's a practical orientation towards the particular things in the world around you. Uh, and so in this regard, I owe a lot to John in mm -hmm. terms of being able to remind yourself that the criterion for being able to identify the significance of an ethical principle, and in particular these Stoic principles, is being able to see what kind of difference it makes in your life, mm -hmm. what kind of different decision you make in light of that. Yeah. So I wanted to ask a, kind of a follow-up. Um, 
the a paper you've written recently actually focuses very specifically on section 52. Am I getting that? Yeah, right? that's right. 52. Oh, the, the last, the which last, is the last section yeah. um, of this text. And um, you're identifying a kind of paradox that arises there. So just tell us a little bit about that paradox in section 52. Uh, section 52. Yeah. So uh, a funny thing about, about what happens whenever you start reading the Enchiridion, mm -hmm. you're like, yeah, you're kind of, you're, you're rolling along. You're like, yeah, I kind of got, like, as you approach 52, you're kind of like, I kind of got stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kind of got this. Yeah. Um, 52 is weird. Okay, yeah. 52 is weird. And so it, it's it's easy to skip because mm -hmm. you're kind of coming up on the end and they got quotes from Socrates and Euripides at the mm -hmm. end and those are fun. Uh, and so 52 is easy to skip, but 52 is actually really deep. Mm -hmm. uh, and so here's how it goes. And so, in fact, I kind of gave you a little taste of it before, which is um, Stoicism is a view that all the theoretical stuff is really important, but, but because of the fact that it ties in with the practical stuff. Mm -hmm. So here's how Epictetus presents it. The reason why you got into philosophy is to be able to live well. Mm -hmm. Here's how you do live well. Don't be a fraud. Don't be a faker. Don't be false. Mm -hmm. Right? Don't be a bullshitter. Mm -hmm. Right? The whole point of philosophy is to cut through all your fucking bullshit. Right? And all the bullshit around you. Cut through the bullshit. May pseudine. No falsity. Mm -hmm. No falsity. So, how do you cut through all the falsity? Perfect your critical thinking. How do you perfect your critical thinking? Get good at logic. Ah, but what happens when you start getting good at logic? You get obsessed with the paradoxes, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, this sentence is both this sentence is false, and mm -hmm. uh, and all the other kinds of paradoxes that come mm -hmm. along with logic, right? And then that requires that you develop all sorts of like really technical tools to be able to solve those paradoxes, mm -hmm. and those are really fun and really interesting. But what happens is, look at how far we got off from the, yeah. the right? Now, <laughs> the important thing is that because in order to live by these core principles and see them as true, we have to perfect our critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that's the most important is the thing that we do last. And the thing that's the least important is the thing that we do first. Because it's the means for us to be able to get to the thing that's the most important thing, which is see, cut through all the bullshit and live a good life. Mm -hmm. But the tools for cutting through all the bullshit become so theoretical and so tempting and so interesting. Mm -hmm. Right? Like the paradoxes are interesting. And so what happens is we get distracted. Yeah. And in working on these paradoxes, we don't just get distracted from the, the don't, don't be full of bullshit. We become better bullshitters. <laughs> It's oh, awful. No. That's awful. That's so terrible. Yeah. And maybe you've seen it. Matt, philosophy sure. was supposed to save us. I know. Philosophy was supposed to save us, but it actually makes us worse. It makes <laughs> us better rationalizers. Mm -hmm. And so this is the this is the great worry, right? This is how the the Enchiridion gives you a worry that you should have about yourself after having even done the Enchiridion right. I, I have been teaching <laughs> undergraduate logic classes. I have this uh, worry. <laughs> this is exactly yeah. it. So yeah, you've had yeah. this experience where mm -hmm. they all show up and like you have not made them better critical thinkers. You've made them better sharks. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where it's like, yeah, I gave you the concept of ad baculum or ad hominem and now all you do is just beat up your friends with it. <laughs> it's like at, here comes Thanksgiving and I've give you, given you the concepts of fallacies and what are you going to do you're going to harass your family over the thanksgiving dinner <laughs> with this right the tools of philosophy don't make us we like and why because we're not wise right we apologize to any parents and Vanderbilt <laughs> students watching this interview. Yeah. we're the we're the ones who did that to you we, we're, the, we, we're the reason your <laughs> uncle stormed off in the middle exactly of thanksgiving it. dinner someone someone got identified giving an ad hominem and next thing you know he takes the turkey yeah. leg and is gone <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so this mm -hmm. is so yeah, you've seen this in the logic class, right? These tools for critical thinking don't don't because because it's the self-defense model. So mm -hmm. we kind of make a little I mean this we can get back to the stoicism thing, but this is a sort of a broader problem, yeah. which is the tools of philosophy are supposed to help us become more wise, become more reflective, become better. But the thing is is that those tools are merely tools. And if we are not yet already wise, we'll misuse them. Mm -hmm. And so you can have all the tools for being able to identify logical fallacies or to be able to identify certain kinds of principles, uh, ethical principles, but you can use exactly those exact same tools to rationalize, mm -hmm. to, beat, uh, to, to, to beat up another person. Mm -hmm. um, and so another one of these, this is not my own insight, but this is, one, this is another one of a piece. Ethicists are people who are less likely to call their parents. They're, they're people who are more likely, more likely to not return no library books. Is that not horrible? That's upsetting. <laughs> That's upsetting. Why? And the hypothesis is, and it's a reasonable one, they're better at rationalizing. Mm, yeah. Right. They're this is an exceptional case. Yeah, this is, yeah, really, who can really say? Who can really 
to say? Yeah. Or like, yeah, I can I can see exactly the reason why like the hmm. utilitarian calculus works it out so that yeah. I keep this library right. book. Yeah. Um, because I'll get more heat ons out of it or whatever. Yeah. Right. And so um, and so uh, because and so the the basic thought, so we'll back up back to the Stoics, the Enchiridion is not for people who are perfect, right? The handbook is not for perfect sages. The handbook is for those who Epictetus calls progressors. And progressors are folks that are kind of, they're still not wise. They're doing better than the people who are, who believe all the bullshit. These are people who are trying to, who, who are trying to get better and trying to, and trying to see the world right. Uh, but they're not yet good at it. So they have to practice it. But because they have to practice it, they're not, they're not perfect at it. And if you give the people these tools to get better, they can, and they're not yet better, they'll use them, they'll use them for real. Mm-hmm. And they'll use them on themselves. They'll use them on each other. Like with the the fallacy theories, the fallacy uh, identifying, but they'll use them on themselves uh, as as means of rationalizing. Mm-hmm. And so the hope that Epictetus gives us at the end of the Enchiridion is a is on the one hand a hope that seeing this, seeing this phenomenon, mm-hmm. that the tools for making ourselves wise can also be the tools for uh, rationalizing and making ourselves less wise. Um, the hope that Epictetus has is that seeing that will help us prevent ourselves from doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm given the history of Stoicism uh, and given the history of philosophy, uh, I'm less inclined to have that hope. <laughs> I think that Epictetus ends this with a kind of a warning, but and but the hope is that the warning is sufficient. Mm-hmm. But I'm unsure that merely a warning is sufficient, especially to those who are not wise. Well, this is a nice way to segue into some of the stuff that you've done more in sort of contemporary um, meta-philosophy. I mean, right. Part of what you've been already uh, talking about is sort of, you could say, Epictetus' meta-philosophy, sort of right. philosophizing right. about the nature of philosophy or what it can offer, what its limits are, or how it should be conducted, how it should be used, how it can be abused. Um, but one of the ways, and, and, and strike, correct me if I'm wrong, this sounds very connected, um, that you've uh, uh, sort of entered the debate about meta-philosophy is through this idea of the Owl of Minerva problem. And it's very similar to the kind of problem you just raised uh, with the end of Epictetus' text. Uh, such a great observation. Yeah. yeah, I think that the in Corinthian 52 is an instance of the Owl of Minerva problem. Okay, yeah, so tell us uh, what that problem is Yeah, uh, and, and what your sort of approach to it is. A broader, so this is a broader perspective on this. And uh, and again, the, the, the thing about ethicists being good at rationalizing their ethical choices is another instance of this. Um, but the alum nerva problem is, uh, well, so we'll explain the metaphor first and then kind of get to the theoretical insight. Uh, the metaphor is that the alum, it's a kind of a poetic uh, instance, comes from the great German philosopher uh, Gerhard Hegel, uh, which is that um, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk. Mm-hmm. So that just means uh, wisdom comes in hindsight. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, after everything is done, right, uh, the sun is going down, it's only at the very end. Uh, uh, does 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 wisdom arise, and so um, that the the background thought seems to be that in that one basic version of it is that we have to make mistakes in order to be able to learn. So that's one version of it. So we have to have errors, and then we learn from our errors, and wisdom comes from making mistakes. Mm-hmm. So that's we might call a sort of a strict empiricist mm-hmm. version of that. So you have to kind of you have to kind of skin your knee a couple times to know how to kind of walk right and things like that, but. Here's another feature to this, which is one of the things about becoming wise is that it's not just supposed to be that your knowledge of the world just changes the world. Your knowledge of the world is supposed to change you. Mm -hmm. You're the kind of thing that once you get clearer about the kind of thing that you are, you change in light of that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, This is, in fact, what know yourself is supposed to be. It's Mm -hmm. like, don't just know yourself and you're like, okay, I know myself, and then I just continue doing the same thing. The same self I was before (laughs) I knew myself. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) Presumably, one knows oneself in order to change oneself, Mm -hmm. that that one's self knowledge in some ways has a kind of practical effect Mm -hmm. that it changes who you are and you act in light of that knowledge that makes it so that it's different. So the thought is then that wisdom isn't just that you learn because you make mistakes. Wisdom lear- wisdom is, in fact, that you're changed by that knowledge, not just so that you avoid the mistakes, but that you also know something about yourself, about, you might say, being able to generalize, see other kinds of mistakes and things like that. Mm-hmm. So this is, you might say, the sort of the optimistic version of the Owl of Minerva, right? Mm-hmm. And so this is the reason why we have the fallacy theory stuff. So mm-hmm. fallacy theory works, here, works exactly the same way here, which is... Um, 
you know, you learn the fallacy stuff and you're like, oh, ad hominem, don't do that. So now, like, I had a little bit of knowledge. And look at this, I'm no longer calling you, no longer making fun of your teeth or something like that. Because <laughs> in order to say it, we're like, whatever, right? You're like, oh, look, he's wrong because he's got because he's got bad breath or something like Very that. Very self-conscious about yeah, that. Yeah, like, <laughs> we were just having coffee. <laughs> We can lighten them. Yeah, in yeah, right. Oh, yeah, right? that's exactly it. Yeah. Uh, well, we could be like, yeah, it was like, well, I don't like all that hair up there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for evening. Hey, that. all right. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but the point here is that, like, that's the optimistic version of the Al Minerva, right? Mm -hmm. and, like, wisdom comes, and it comes, at, it comes, and it comes in hindsight, and comes at the end of the day. But at least it comes, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then there's a pessimistic version of the Al Minerva. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's where we get the shark problem yeah. with uh, folks learning the fallacies. Mm -hmm. That's where we get the rationalization problem with the folks learning ethics. Mm -hmm. Right, that's where we get the sort of the veer off the path and get obsessed with like weird logical paradoxes with the Stoics. Yeah. Right, um, that uh, that that the that we got that we've got these tools of wisdom that we've got these things that give us uh, certain kinds of self knowledge and knowledge about the norms. But the thought, the, but the thought is that that, given the fact that we're not yet good, mm -hmm. <laughs> we are not nece we're not necessarily improved by that knowledge. We use that knowledge for bad. Mm -hmm. um, simple example, right? You ever saw watched like soccer games and things like that? Mm -hmm. Like we got the rule against like tripping people in the penalty box. Right. Yeah. Right. You got penalty kick. Yeah, yeah. And then you get a penalty kick for it. But then, okay, well, we know that we shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And we know that we, and, but the thought here is that like now people who have the ball and you're in the other team's penalty box, what do you do if someone like gives you a little bump? You're like, I'm oh, falling right over. Yeah. I'm falling over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you've ever watched soccer, like that is the, yeah, yeah. that is you the, draw, you draw the, the penalty. Yeah. Well, you draw a penalty. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's called diving mm -hmm. and diving would not be possible if we weren't aware of the rules that we make for ourselves and whatever, right? right? That it's that that's a kind of a case where it's like our self knowledge creates not a case for us to improve ourselves, but a case for us to be terrible. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that loop isn't done because now we have like a, now we have a you can get a yellow card for diving, <laughs> and so now defenders will crash into you and be like he was diving. Yeah. <laughs> he the loop get a, I, yeah. I fouled him, but now he yeah. should get a now he should get a yellow card because mm -hmm. it looked like he was diving. So th things like that happen, right? Yeah. The loop continues. Um, and the same thing goes in fallacy theory, uh, so in argumentation theory. Um, here's how it goes, where it's like, look, you know, the thought here is that you're supposed to learn the fallacies in order to get a, to be a better reasoner and avoid certain kinds of fallacies. But a new kind of fallacy is made possible mm -hmm. by that, yeah. which is the sometimes called the fallacy fallacy, mm -hmm. right? It's like you identify someone's reasoning as fallacious, and then you go, well, the conclusion can't be right because the reasoning is bad. You're like... That doesn't, that doesn't follow. follow. <laughs> right? There are lots of terrible arguments yeah. for true things out there. Mm -hmm. And so um, it doesn't follow that something's false because of the fact that the argument for it's bad. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the fallacy fallacy. And by the way, that's possible. We, we made a whole new fallacy. Like yeah. we, we just made a new thing. Yeah. And we made a new bad thing by introducing rules to correct us from doing bad things. Yeah, without fallacy theory, there'd be no fallacy there'd be fallacy. No fallacy, we, fallacy. We created it. <laughs> we made we a new... It. Hey, and, and so... These new pathologies mm -hmm. are made possible yeah. by our reflection, yeah. uh, and that's that's terrible news. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, is that okay? So that's just with these sorts of things, but it happens in philosophy too. Yeah. It happens in philosophy too, and so um, a small version of it. You've seen it. You've seen majors. You ever seen majors like show up and like I know I was one mm -hmm. where it was like look I learned a little bit I like I, the story of me it was like I learned a little Plato I was like I think philosophy I think I'm done with philosophy I, was like, <laughs> I figured it I'm out like I'm a really good philosopher now because I can quote some Plato yeah. I got it all figured out mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that happens that sort of false that false wisdom mm -hmm. uh, that comes from in some ways kind of feeling like you've mastered some great uh, ideas. Um, and then you hear somebody else, and um, I mean, this happens in metaphilosophy all the time, where we get a debate between two folks about like free will, and someone says, "Oh, well, here's some evidence that we've got free will," and someone says, "Well, no, but th that's evidence only if you're committed to this kind of philosophical approach." Mm -hmm. And they're like, "Oh, well, now it's no longer a debate about <laughs> about mm -hmm. free will. Now it's a debate about rationalism versus empiricism." Yeah. And you're like, "Well, and now the criterion for that debate goes up another level, right?" It's like. What, uh, is it the scientific model or is it a religious model or mm -hmm. something like that? Or is it a poetic model? Uh, what's that criterion? Well, is it truth or is it inspiration? Or any of these other sorts of things. It just keeps going up and up, up mm -hmm. and up another level. Um, that we got a kind of a regress problem of criteria mm -hmm. for philosophical arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens 
It can come out of the free will debate. It can come out of a debate about testimonial injustice. It can come out of any of these debates. Anytime that you've got a disagreement and you can identify the source of the disagreement because of other sort of bro more broad philosophical orientations, that pushes the criterion out. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, is that it turns out that then metaphilosophy is no longer a way of understanding or recasting or finding a way to make any progress forward in a debate, but instead of just explaining away mm -hmm. so much of everything, aside, except as a sort of a giant clash of systems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's about all we've got at the end of it. And so, uh, and so it ends up being pathological because it makes it something that was supposed to be mm -hmm. this explanatory and clarifying tool actually becomes an obfuscatory tool. Mm -hmm. It gets in the way of us actually being able to give an argument to each other. Yeah. And in a way, philosophy can never sort of catch up with the problems it itself generates because it's always trying to hit a moving target. That's right. Because and it's contributing to its own movement. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. it. It's, it's kind of like one of mm -hmm. those, did you ever see like the, um, uh, uh, the Keystone Cops? Where like the cop, like one of these guys, he's he's got his cap on. He, he drops his cap, and as he's trying to pick up his cap, he accidentally kicks the cap to, uh, as he's okay, picking, yeah, trying to yeah, pick yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah, and, every, and so like, right. and, and so it's just one of these yeah. sort of like it's one of these things where it's like as you're trying to reach out for it, you push it as you mm -hmm. you know you are trying to get the cup, but my hand going for the cup keep pushing the cup along. Uh, that's kind of how yeah. this works. Um, and the, the last part of it is that is that we as philosophers, once we see this, one question is, does this insight have an Owl of Minerva problem? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> does the Owl of Minerva problem have yes. an Owl of Minerva problem? And the answer is, of course it does. Yeah. Right? And one reason why is that the Owl of Minerva problem, given how I've stated it at least, is a kind of skeptical attitude, mm -hmm. is a kind of skepticism. And notice that this, once we've even identified that, it's subject to the exact same kind yeah. of more global kinds of critical. Yeah, it, it itself is a metaphilosophical move. So why wouldn't it be subject to the, the same point? Yeah, and so it's not, a, it's not an exception to any of it. Um, but in some ways, I, like I, I, I will, I will, I, you know, I, maybe this is the more controversial part. So far, everything is. So far, everything we've 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 been in some kind of agreement here. At the very least, maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see how you're doing. Uh, but I, but I do think that there's something about the Owl of Minerva problem that makes it so that even if there's an Owl of Minerva problem for the Owl of Minerva problem, that doesn't prevent the problem from nevertheless being explanatory. Yeah, that's interesting. Does okay. that make sense? I, I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, because it sort of substantiates your own skeptical conclusion. Is that yeah, the and so and that may be, and again, that may be self-serving. That may mm -hmm. be yet more rationalizing. It's like, yeah, this guy's a skeptic, and so he doesn't think that any of these things. <laughs> so of course, right. he's going to be able to tell this explanatory story that undercuts all these sorts of things. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, that's why he doesn't think that there's philosophical progress. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a new kind of skeptical trope. Um, and so I, and so I think that that's I think that there's something right about that. But notice that in doing that. That itself is a kind of explanatory skeptical trope, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> right? It's a kind of a debunking strategy, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so I think that there's something. There's, I think that there's something powerful to it that um, that does a lot of explanatory work. Uh, and I think that in moments in the history of philosophy, we kind of see it through glass darkly. Yeah. I think that, that we see it there in Epictetus. I think that uh, Rene Descartes has got some moments where mm -hmm. he sees it. There, uh, there might be one or two moments in Plato where I think that he sees it. Um, Aristotle's worried about it, but I don't think that he. I don't think that he has got a got much of a sort of a theory about it. Um, and then, uh, but really, um, a lot of my more recent work has really been wrestling with this. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea th uh, that, uh, especially in argumentation theory, that our vocabulary for criticizing our arguments and holding our arguments to normative standards itself is a kind of source for new kinds of errors mm -hmm. uh, that I've been calling uh, meta-argumentative fallacies. Mm -hmm. That you can commit, these are fallacies one can commit only if you've mastered the vocabulary of criticizing and reasoning. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's bad news though. <laughs> let me ask you, I wanted to ask about one more area of your, of your current research and it, ha it has again to do with argument. And, it, and it actually I'll go back to the quote from uh, our, our mutual friend Jay Bernstein that every, what is it, every philosopher is every other philosopher's worst enemy? Is yeah. that how you put it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or maybe mortal enemy. Maybe, maybe mortal. Was I think it was oh, mortal enemy. Worse, that, that mortal. Was, that okay. seems more Jay, that seems right. more Jay Bernstein. To, that's in it. <laughs> Good setup for the question because there is this debate in argumentation theory which you, um, you've entered into uh, 
that has to do with the adversariality of argument. I mean, um, Mortal Kombat is one way to put adversariality. Maybe that's not what, what argumentation theorists think about it. Right. But, um, so there's a question, there's a sort of like general question about the nature of argument. Is it inherently adversarial? And then on top of that, you could say like a question about the ethics of argument. Um, if it's not essential or necessary to argumentation, ought we to avoid it? Ought we to avoid it in all cases? Are there instances where it can be beneficial, um, appropriate? Um, so tell us a little bit about how the kinds of moves you've made in this question about the adversariality uh, uh, yeah. debate in argumentation theory. Yeah, the adversariality debate. And, and, and I think that's a really great way to kind of uh, slice things up, which is you might say that there's the metaphysical question or the, the question is like, what is argument? What's mm -hmm. it all about? Is there something essential to argument that makes it um, adversarial or something essentially adversarial mm -hmm. about argument or not? And then there's the question of how do we um, normatively evaluate argument in light of how we answer that, that question? Um, so, uh, I'm someone who says that argument is essentially adversarial. I've got a handful of arguments for that. Uh, but I do think that we can nevertheless um, judge uh, the degree of adversariality in argument as appropriate or inappropriate. So argument's essentially adversarial, but it can be more or less adversarial. Um, mm -hmm. So my thesis is that argument has to be what, what I call dialectically minimally adversarial. Okay. Uh, and what that means is, look, whenever we argue, um, we for the most part are arguing because we're trying to sort the true from the false. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is we're, we're giving reasons that sort between some options. Mm -hmm. So often they come out of disagreements. So disagreements, uh, disagreements between two people often provide two options. And then what we do is we aggregate evidence that cuts between those two options, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how ever, that's what we, what, we, what we might call dialectical adversariality. Mm -hmm. that, we, that because of our interests that may conflict, we're given options and then we aggregate reasons that then decide between those options. Mm -hmm. And so it's inherently that, kind of contest at the very least. Yeah, that's yeah. right. There's a kind of a contest, yeah. or like even the even the, the 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 image of weighing our reasons, right? Yeah. It's like we have the we have justice or something like that with mm -hmm. the scales. There's always an uh, there's always an opposing feature yeah. that reasons aren't just simply reasons for. They're also in order to be a reason for it also has to be there has to be a reason against. There mm -hmm. has to be something that it is right. slicing between. Uh, and so that's what gives reasons their friction is what some, what sometimes gets called their contrastivity, mm -hmm. that a reason cuts a contrast between certain kinds of things. And so some simple examples, which are that, look, I can have a good, you can have good reason for thinking that Matt here is having coffee in his coffee cup because it's a coffee cup, right? And the same thing here is, goes for me, right? It's in a coffee cup, so it's probably coffee, but I'll... It's water, right? <laughs> now, the crucial thing here is that that's a good reason to think that I'm having coffee or, or you're having coffee or water or something like that. But if you looked inside and you saw the, white, the, the, the clear liquid in there, it's like, okay, well, that's water over coffee. But it's not a reason to think that it's water over gin. Right. <laughs> Or it's a little early or petrol, right? <laughs> to go William Z. Yeah. Right. But that's, but that's the crucial thing, which, yeah. is, uh, which is that reasons can be reasons only whenever they're cutting between things. So seeing that this was clear liquid mm -hmm. gave you a reason to think it's water and not coffee, yeah. but it didn't give you a reason to think that it's water and not gin. Yeah. And so those, that's kind of how reasons and evidence works is that you get given some stuff, the evidence pum, comes in and says, favor this over that. But in some mm -hmm. cases, it doesn't. It doesn't do that. So this. So seeing the color of this liquid or the colorlessness of this liquid um, makes it so that you can't make that distinction. And so it's not evidence. Or if it's equal evidence, it's <laughs> sort mm -hmm. of not enough to favor it. So that contrastivity of reasons, that structural feature of how reasons works, uh, is a feature uh, that then gets provided by the argumentative context, mm -hmm. disagreements, questions. What, do I go left or right? Things like that. The and so. Notice, by the way, that one of the benefits of this contrastivity story then gives us ways of making it so that context is no longer some sort of magical thing, mm -hmm. right? It's like, everyone's like, ah, oh, you provide the context. You're like, I don't know what the hell fucking context is. What the fuck is context? You know what context is? The options, Yeah. right? Okay. Now And now the options can explain to me why a reason is a good one as opposed to another one. Someone just mm -hmm. say context. Context makes it good. Context, context. Mm -hmm. Context is nothing. Context doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Once we have the contrast, contrast actually explain why the reasons are better in some cases than other ones, mm -hmm. right? What's the question? That's what does the work. So some benefits there, right? And 
And so once we're actually able to sort of see this structural feature and this dialectical feature of reasons, we then see that every bit of argument then has to be something that's addressing the question, mm -hmm. this or that, or yeah. this or a couple vats, mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that. And so that's the minimal dialectical adversariality of argument. And now you can see why we can ramp it up or dial it down appropriately mm -hmm. Given the given the conditions under which we're applying. Well, that kind of leads to the next question I had. So, so um, uh, metaphysically, arguments are minimally dialectically adversarial. Is that go to the ethics question, or the, what yeah. I was calling the ethics question? Yeah, the right. normative, the practical yeah. question. Right. Is that a bad thing? Uh, right. We, if we can't avoid it, if we can't avoid <laughs> and, it, and usually adversari adversariality sounds bad. Adversariality um, sounds what, bad. What does that mean for sort of the practical side? So, uh, and it's a great and it's a great question. So, one of the things that we need to, whenever we go to the practical side, is uh, go in with the idea that adversariality and uh, adversariality can have bad consequences. Mm -hmm. You can you can because you're trying to win. Mm -hmm suppress evidence and things like that. You can be badly motivated to, to try to not see their evidence as good evidence and things like that. And so you can be a bad interlocutor, mm -hmm. right? You can be a bad inquirer because you feel like you've got a stake in a certain kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's one feature of how adversariality works, right? It's like if, you've got, if you're in a sports team, you play to win, right? If you're an arguer, you play to win. Uh, but that creates a kind of a problem. Um, and that one that um, goes all the way back to Epicurus. Epicurus observed that whenever you're in a philosophical debate, if you lose the philosophical debate, there's also a sense that you're a winner mm -hmm. in the philosophical debate. Mm -hmm. And it's that you see something, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You get repudiated. Yeah. <laughs> you get repudiated and you learn a fucking lesson, mm -hmm. right? I got better. Why? Yeah. Because I lost. Mm -hmm. Like, now again, I think that there's a sports team way to be able to appreciate that too, right? It's like you get like you get schooled and you're like, I see where I need to get better, mm -hmm. right? But there's another thing that comes out of this with argument, which is that you see something maybe true. I mean, if you get refuted, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing true about your view. Yeah. Um, but at the very least, if you lose a philosophical debate, a certain kind of new thing comes out that's mm -hmm. a good, that's that's an unmitigated good, regardless yeah. of these it's other things. An sorts occasion of for learning. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what's this? And one answer is, um, what that is, is that we live forward, mm -hmm. right? So notice, by the way, that you still have to think of yourself as losing. So there's something, still something right. essentially adversarial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you can't even state the big insight against adversariality without saying lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a kind of a, a weird argument uh, for it. But, uh, but it does show certain kinds of limits for this, which is that argument's not a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can still lose and get something out of this. Even if, right. we're, even if we can still get something from this, even whenever you kind of end up on the bad side of it. And, the, and one reason why is because of the fact that whenever you lose an, a debate, you effectively are playing on two teams, right? You've probably had this moment where you change your mind about something, mm -hmm where the view's kind of still yours and that it's got your name, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh, where, like, you look at, like, any, it's like, the, the commitment's still yours. It's like, you, that's still you there, mm -hmm. but now you're like, yeah, but mm, not so much, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so what we are doing with each other and with ourselves whenever we subject ourselves to critical scrutiny with each other is that we are entering into a kind of... Uh, partnership. So there's something cooperative about this adversariality. Mm -hmm. But we're entering into a kind of a partnership where we are each other's own worst enemies, mm -hmm. mortal enemies. But I'm not the mortal enemy of you. Mm -hmm. I'm the mortal enemy of the you that you don't want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the false right? you. The false uh, you, yeah, the, right? The, the, the ignorant you. <laughs> that's right. The you that's the name of the team that loses, mm -hmm. right? That you on the other side will say, not me anymore, yeah. right? Um, that's, and, and I'm better at being that, right? Like I'm, again, you can be self-critical. You can mm -hmm. be the enemy of that version of you, but you are much better at believing your own bullshit. <laughs> right? And I'm really good at believing my bullshit. Oh my God, you have no idea how good I am at believing my bullshit. So we need these adversaries. Why we yeah. need these adversaries. Mm -hmm. And we agree to play those roles for each other. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why, again, dialing down adversariality is useful. It's, it's important for us to still nevertheless have a sting to it because you have to, you have to pry, I have to pry you apart from the you that loves your own bullshit. Yeah. 
And so there has to be a sting to it. You have to, you have to not like that version of you mm -hmm. in order for you to be like, I'm not, I'm not that guy. Right. Right. And so there has to be a sting to it. You have to be able to kind of see yourself distinct from it. Otherwise, you might say that sort of these maximally charitable, mm -hmm. maximally cooperative versions of you are just more yes men. Mm -hmm. Are more just folks who are like, let you know what? Let me help you improve this view yeah. of yours. I'll add. Are you like bullshit? Mm -hmm. I've got stuff that sounds sounds like that too, right? <laughs> I'll add on. And so uh, having and so even when we idealize a an excellent cooperative collaborative person who's a good conversational and arguing partner, we still see them as critical mm -hmm. and often justly critical. And they have to be someone who has to be able to make us so that we don't want to be the person who believes our own bullshit. They have to be opponents of us mm -hmm. still. Yeah. I mean, is it, I find this more compelling. Maybe I should be more adversarial. <laughs> I find it more compelling than I thought I would at the beginning. Um, let's let's talk about how you bring maybe some of this, adversa this productive adversariality into the classroom. How about that? Um, I'd love to hear, um, yeah, like, what do you, what do you really like to teach here at Vanderbilt? What have you, what have you taught in the past that, um, have been some of your, your favorite classes to teach? So, uh, I teach kind of a core for the department. Uh, I teach the ancient philosophy. I teach formal logic. I teach Hellenistic philosophy and I teach general logic. So those are the sort of the four main undergraduate courses that I teach, uh, here at Vanderbilt. Um, the, the logic classes are ones that are devoted really to articulating certain kinds of rules for good inference, rules for well-run argumentation, uh, and also fallacy theory, ways in which we can kind of go off the rails and not run things well. And then I end those classes with some philosophical reflections on, okay, look, we've mastered some concepts in logic. Let's do some philosophy that we wouldn't be able to do mm -hmm. unless we had these logic concepts. Yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, the formal logic class is just on propositional and quantificational logic with identity, articulating those rules, those proof methods, and things like that. So it's a very, very tight focus class. The, the general logic, as you've taught it also, uh, is a class where it's kind of got, it's just a kind of a big tool. It's kind of like a big tool bag mm -hmm. uh, uh, where, you know, argument comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes and forms. And so some inductive stuff, some categorical reasoning, some proposition, some natural deduction, uh, again, some informal logic and fallacy theory. So just kind of big, gra kind of big tool bag mm -hmm. approach uh, to critical thinking. Um, the ancient philosophy class, that, that in some ways is the class that I teach that most closely touches sophomore year version of me. Okay. I teach that class imagining myself mm -hmm. <laughs> in there. Yeah, um, basically there's, you said earlier, it seems yeah. like it would be very close to home. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, in fact, I um, every October whenever I teach the ancient philosophy class, I have a moment, mm -hmm. uh, and it goes like this. Um, when I was, I think, a junior, maybe a sophomore, um, I uh, my my father had a conversation with me. He said, "Look, you want to be a classics major? What? Tell me what." Tell me what career path this puts you on. <laughs> and, I, and he the said, just, question. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's like, well, you know, it's, hey, it's the humanities. Come on. Um, but, uh, but I said, look, you know, here's the image that I had in my mind. He said, look, tell me where that's going to be, where it's going to, where you're going to be in 20 years. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to be on a college campus. I'm going to have on a tweed coat. It's going to be October. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be walking to class, kicking leaves on the ground. And I'm going to have a copy of Homer's Iliad under my under my elbow, walking mm -hmm. to a classroom. It's a nice image. And I said that that's and I said that's where it, and that's what professional success is going to look like mm -hmm. to me. And every October, I walk to my ancient philosophy class. Mm -hmm. I've got my tweed coat on and I kick some leaves, <laughs> and I walk into that classroom. But I'm not carrying Homer. I'm carrying Plato's Republic. <laughs> yeah, it's a close. It's a close second. I'll take it. <laughs> Uh, and I and the amount of yeah. gratitude that I feel on those days, mm -hmm. like it's usually yeah. like a day in the middle of October. Yeah, I'm teaching like book two or three of Plato, and I'm walking to class, and I just feel a rush of just, gratitude. Yeah, how lucky! Yeah, mm -hmm. wow! Yeah, how amazing! It's not Homer, but Plato will do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, and so that class, in some ways, is a kind of a survey of what I think the greatest hits of the ancient mm -hmm. world and philosophy are. So from Thales all the way to Marcus Aurelius, a kind of a, a pop in on the high classical age in Greece or in Athens with uh, Plato and Aristotle, Socrates cutting cutting the ice there, uh, your pre-Socratics, and then 
little dip ins on the Hellenistic philosophers. So mm -hmm. a little dip in on the Stoics, a little dip in on the uh, the skeptics, a little dip in on the Epicureans and the Cynics. Um, but it's a really a kind of a, just a big, you know, it's it's a long period. It's a rich period. It's kind of like the the Wild West of philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, there aren't a lot of rules yet. Um, and um, and it's really, it's wild. Um, and, the, and, and I'll tell you, the class really inspires stu students. Um, I've, again, Vanderbilt students, so fantastic, so highly motivated, and so keen to get kind of punched and moved along. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, uh, and so that class is kind of pitched as like a kind of a Renaissance class, right? It's like you get, you know, you have all these sort of artists and you have all these sort of, you know, new philosophers in the Renaissance getting exposed to these ancient sources. And they do all sorts of cool shit with them. Like, they, you know, you've got, you've got Raphael's School in Athens and mm -hmm. you've got this whole neoclassical movement. Um, you've got Machiavelli. Um, and you see this sort of resurgence of energy and humanism that you see in the Renaissance. And that's kind of what I see my class as being. It's mm -hmm. like a kind of like, here's the ancient world. And it's not, and we're not just going to play Roman right now. Mm -hmm. We're not going to just ape them. You're going to be inspired by them. And so you're going to, you're, I want you to take something about Thales or take something about Parmenides or take something about Plato and make it yours and make it something that's living and breathing and doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what the Renaissance was, right? The Renaissance took those things from the ancient world and made them live. Um, and so that's kind of what I want from the, my students in that class. Um, the Hellenistic philosophy class is a historian, like is a historian's class mm -hmm. though. That's a deep dive on, yeah. on really the big four schools, um, the Stoics, the Epicureans, uh, the, 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 the cynics, and then the, the various forms of skepticism. And so that's a much, his, much more sort of stolid historical class, deep dive stuff. Uh, but that, that, you know, that ancient philosophy class, that, is, that, that class is made to be an inspir kind of an inspiring class, mm -hmm. uh, saying something like, look, there's something about Greece and Rome that did something right, and we can rekindle that uh, in ourselves here and now. I, I'm inspired. I, I want to <laughs> sign me up. I, I, I'm gonna, I want to enroll. That's right. You don't have to wear a toga for it either. But that's, <laughs> um, what about uh, in the future? Are there any classes um, that you you haven't taught, but you're, you're thinking about, or you'd like to sort of put together for future semesters? Yeah. So um, you know, uh, I've. Uh, I have active work in contemporary work in epistemology. I don't mm -hmm. do. Uh, I haven't had a chance to teach it in a while, um, but I'm working up classes on uh, just contemporary surveys of theories of knowledge mm -hmm. and ways that it's relevant to social questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, a kind of a social epistemology approach. Uh, one of the other things that I'm also thinking about doing that would be for uh, undergraduates and graduate students would be a, a course on argumentation theory. Uh, trying to get straight, like again, fallacy theory is a sort of a great place to start. But what exactly are we doing whenever we argue? What what are the norms whenever we are whenever we have like lots of different audiences and lots of different arguers? Uh, a standard model for argumentation theory is that you've got two people talking at at the same time, like and sharing a space or something like that. And that's not how we argue these days. Mm -hmm. Most of our argument is not dialogical, but di but monological. Uh, and so we need new theories to be able to address that, um, that so much of our argument isn't sort of sitting with each other and, and things like that. We're often not even addressing each other. We're talking mm -hmm. about each other to other people. How's that work? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, uh, we need theories to be able to handle that. And so um, we've got emerging accounts as to how, to how to theorize it, how to work on it, and how to get better at it. Mm -hmm. So that's one of, the, one of the classes that's in the works. Great. Well, sitting with you, I mean, what I've really gotten is it, you've got so much to offer from like the ancients to contemporary epistemology and argumentation theory, but there really is this strong sense in which it's really continuous. It's like a you're, you are thinking through a common set of problems from two and a half millennia ago to now and, uh, and taking a lot of different resources uh, in really interesting ways to do that. So, uh, Professor Aiken, thank you so much for, for sitting down with me. Thanks for letting me tell that story, Matt. Yeah.